Good morning, church. Today's scripture reading will be in Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. In the year of King Isaiah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with a train of his robe filling the temple. Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. Two covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds trembled at the voice of him who called out. While the temple was filling with smoke, then I said, Woe is me, for I am ruined, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar with tongs. He touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, and your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is forgiven. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am, send me. You as a visitor, if you're visiting with us for the first time or you're coming back, again, we know there are so many things you could be doing uh, this weekend, and you've chosen to come and, and praise God with us, and we are so blessed by your presence. Thank you for joining with us. I have a letter here that I'd like to uh, read. It's from Jan and Doug Sears. Uh, Doug just graduated from our, our school. He says, there's no way to express the love we have experienced since joining the Puyallup Church. We deeply appreciate everyone and everything this church has done for us. A simple thank you doesn't suffice, and an avalanche of adjectives wouldn't begin to convey the gratitude and genuine love we have for this congregation. Your support means the world to us. Just knowing we have a piece of your heart and will always be included in your prayers brings us great comfort and joy. Thank you for your generous support these last several years while I studied at Civi, and with your generosity and recognition upon graduation. We look forward to a long and fruitful relationship here in Puyallup and pray that we can be a part of the work here. No matter where the Lord, Lord's will takes us, we will always genuinely feel proud and privileged to be included in such a special fellowship. We truly don't have words sufficient to express our gratitude. Thank you again, and know that we are deeply touched and blessed to abide in this church. You are certainly welcome. Uh, we're so glad um, to have you here as well. We're going to look at Isaiah chapter 6, as you uh, probably supposed. Uh, before we get there, it's the, the season for traveling and vacations. Uh, and I suppose you have your plans already. Uh, have you ever found yourself on a journey and wanting to visit because it's Sunday at congregation and you don't know uh, the time at which they meet and so you get on the website and you look for them and, and you find uh, the time. One summer I was traveling across Washington in Oregon going through Idaho on my way to Colorado uh, and I'd been in Coeur d'Alene a number of times and uh, there was no time zone difference but on my trip I was going farther south and if you've ever journeyed that way you probably learned that Idaho in the north is Pacific time, and Idaho in the south is mountain time. And as I traveled across the state line, there was a great big sign there that said that the time had changed, and I was immediately an hour late for worship. See, Sue, she thinks I'm coming in late after class over there, two or three minutes, five, and she said, oh, that's late. Uh, I was an hour late already, so you know what I did? I turned around and went back because then I would be early. The difficulty with that was there was a, <laughs> there was a guy standing on the porch, because I'd never been to this congregation, and he was so happy to see me, I thought maybe he was a long lost relative or something, I, okay. And he started asking me questions. Have you ever preached? Yes. Have you ever led the Lord's Supper? Yes. Uh, and I go in and look in it, and it's all ladies, except him. <laughs> <laughs> And because I got there so early, I was able, he, he led singing, I was able to preach, 
Uh, he led the prayers, and I was able to do the Lord's Supper, and together we handed out the communion emblems. So time is an important thing. Uh, and you may find that, that God uses those little boo-boos uh, to get us to serve in, the, in a place where someone uh, has a need. And so I was thankful after I had been there and found out how difficult it would be every, every Sunday uh, to be in that kind of a situation. We ask oftentimes at some of our traditional sayings, when does worship start? And I think if you pay attention to Isaiah chapter 6, you, you might see that that's really kind of an odd question. Wouldn't it be more accurate to think of joining the worship of God that's already in progress? In Isaiah chapter 6, 1 through 8, look for what is going on in the throne room of, room of God when Isaiah arrives. In the year of King Uzzah, Uzzah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds trembled at the voice of him who called out while the temple was filling with smoke. Whoa, wouldn't that be something to experience? I can't even imagine what it must have sounded like. And of course, Isaiah, honest soul that he is, realized this is a holy place, and this is a holy God. And he said, woe is me, for I am ruined, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. And then one of the seraphim flew to me. You know, seraphim is the word, it means burning, flaming, okay? And it was used to describe the dragons and the snakes that would bite you and burn. And so this is a created being whose praise and glory uh, is so great and so spectacular, it's like he's a burning coal himself. And he comes and he touches uh, uh, the coal to Isaiah's lips. For my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts, he says, but the coal touched his lips and he said, behold, this has touched your lips and your iniquity is taken away from you and your sin is forgiven. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, here am I, send me. There are a number of amazing things in in this short, short passage. But you'll notice uh, in this passage what time worship actually started. This is the official time, by the way. Worship didn't begin when Isaiah showed up. It had already been going on and apparently had always been going on. Worship doesn't begin when you and I decide to sing a song of praise. Worship happens wherever God is present. We simply follow the New Testament teaching and set uh, a meeting time with others because we are connected to space and time uh, and so that we can assemble together we, we choose a time consistent with the scripture and we assemble on the first day of the week but that's not when heaven began to worship it's only when we joined in when Isaiah joins the worship via a vision he immediately is aware of his own sinfulness but the grace of God provides a way for Isaiah to be set free from his sin. And then Isaiah hears something that is extraordinary. Perhaps maybe in your life you've accidentally listened in on a private conversation from someone that's quite important. Or maybe you accidentally uh, heard something on your cell phone uh, that was coming through that you shouldn't have. But here he hears a conversation of God. And it's not an accident that he's there. He was brought there for a reason, and Isaiah hears God say, Whom shall I send? Who will go with? Who, who will go for us? I love Isaiah's immediacy. Immediacy. He responds, Here am I, send me. Maybe you've had a, a similar experience, not a vision, but you've seen the holiness of God and his word. And it caused you to realize your own sin. 
And then you sought and received the forgiveness of God through his son's blood. And you were united with him in baptism. That you could die to yourself and be born again. If you've had this experience, then you probably know there is also a call for us as God's messengers. Jesus' final words to the 11 apostles in Matthew 28, 19 are somewhat similar in purpose to what happened in the, in the throne room of God. For Jesus said in verse 19, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Jesus ends his command to go with an exhortation that the apostles should teach every disciple everything that he's commanded. And so what has he just commanded? That they should go. And so what does that mean? Through 2,000 years of generations of Christians down to our time, the message of Jesus is the same. We're standing in that throne room listening to the conversation of God. And he's saying, who shall we send? And Jesus says, you go. It's a little bit different. It's a little bit different because Isaiah had a question. We have a command. The world today is in as much trouble as in the days of Isaiah. People are lost. God cares. But people don't know that he cares. And through the words of Jesus in Matthew 28, he's presenting to us a choice to stay or to go. Think for a moment about who's asking for our participation. This is a God who is being worshipped right now by the whole universe, worshipped in an amazing way beyond what we can even see in these words in Isaiah. The worship of God didn't start with us or our congregation at 11 o'clock, and it won't stop at 12 noon. Seraphim have been calling out back and forth beyond our imagination of time to each other, saying, Holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. God is being worshipped because he is God. And the whole created universe in some way, in some form, is echoing praise to him. He is almighty God. And the whole universe is his magnificent chorus, praising him in a way that we can only imagine. In the young adults class, when we started discussing evidence for the existence of God, we talked about the universe. That's an interesting thing to think about. We looked at how huge our galaxy, the Milky Way, is. And it is only one of 170 billion visible galaxies in the universe. And critics of intelligent design might ask, well, if the universe was created as the home for humanity, why is it so big? The universe was not created simply as a home for humanity. The universe was created for one purpose, to praise its creator. And when you understand that, its bigness is nothing because of who the universe is praising. God spoke. He breathed. And out came galaxies. We can't even comprehend who God is. But the universe remembers its creator. In Psalm 148, the psalmist begins with praise the Lord. In Hebrew, that's what? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's what praise Jehovah, praise the Lord. And then he continues. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his hosts. And so the songwriter reminds us of things that are bigger and beyond us. The heavens, the heights, the angels, and the hosts, all of whom are singing and praising our God. And then he comes down to our solar system in verses 3 through 6. 
Praise him, sun and moon, and praise him, all stars of light. Praise him, highest heavens and the waters that are above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded, and they were created. He also established them forever and ever. He has made a decree which will not pass away. But the psalmist doesn't want you and me to be left out of the praise. So in verse 7, guess what? Praise the Lord from the earth. And soon everything and everyone on the whole earth is invited to praise God. From kings and all peoples in verse 11 to old men and children in verse 12. And then in verse 13 he says, Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His glory is above earth and heaven. By the time we get invited into the chorus of God, who's already singing? The entire universe. The entire universe. Yes, God appreciates our praise and honor. But the whole universe praises him. I don't think we can imagine what worship is like in heaven. And it's not going to end in 15 minutes. God is big. He is powerful. He is beautiful and amazing in every way. And all the universe praises him, whether in space and time or beyond. It is this God, this very God, who had a brief conversation on his throne in the heavenly places when a mere human being happened to be there. And he asked, whom shall I send? Who will go for us? I guarantee you, I guarantee you, everything in creation that could hear and understand was about to jump to the front of the line when Isaiah says, here am I, send me. Gasp! Angels could have gone, doesn't he know about Michael, the archangel? Of, or Gabriel, the bringer of glad tidings? Before anyone else, can accept the call of God. Isaiah did. But you know what's more amazing than all of that? God said, okay. It was all right. A lonely human being would be his partner in a message to his people that would have both gloom and judgment and hope and joy. Every time a rose blooms, every time a bird sings, every time an ocean wave crashes on rocky shores, every time a snowflake flutters quietly down and lands softly, when a baby cries, when a child laughs, all of God's creation is praising him. A similar situation is presented to us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 15. Paul is speaking of the death of Jesus on the cross to pay for our sins. And he says of Christ, He died for all, so that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose on their behalf. He died for all is Christ, right? So they who live, who is that? They who live. It's us. We live because he died. He offered his life that we might have ours. He took our punishment. And he forgave us of our sin. And Paul tells us here. He died for all so that they who live might no longer live for themselves. Whoa. I had to sit down for that one. No longer live for myself? How much of my time and my thought is really about myself? How often have I said, not me, send someone else? So how do we live for Christ? In verse 20, Paul explains, Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making an appeal through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. 
He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God. Did you know that God is willing to let you be his ambassador? And not only is he willing, he eagerly seeks your partnership. We have an opportunity to be sent as messengers like Isaiah was sent. In Isaiah's time, the gospel was only hinted at in places like Isaiah 53, though we recognize it clearly, don't we? But now we preach a very open and clear gospel, and that's what we're called to share. In Matthew 28, 18 through 20, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 15 through 21, there is no doubt what God wants his people to do. There is no doubt. We, we are to take the gospel of Jesus to every nation, on planet Earth. That includes starting where we live. And Jesus will be with us. What did, what did he say in Matthew 28, verse 20? Till the end of the age. He does not send us out alone. But he goes with us. And I think, if you'll study the scriptures, he probably goes ahead of us. Because he goes where we will not go. Think about it. What country would you not go to? There are probably about 17,000 unique people groups in the world. And there are probably 7,000 of those people groups who've never received the gospel. Not orally and not written. 7,000 people groups. Jesus told us to go into all the world to every nation. Are we not troubled? Is that not our mission? That Jesus has gone ahead to prepare for us? We're not doing this on our own. Jesus invites us to join him. He doesn't force us to go. He's simply saying, this is what I'm doing. This is where I'm going. This is my priority. Join me. If you want to be close to Jesus, and maybe you haven't felt very close to him lately, if you want to dwell intimately with the Son of God and feel the breath of heaven on your life, then you need to be where Jesus is. Perhaps you've spent way too long trying to get Jesus to come to where you are. What I'm suggesting is that you consider the idea of getting where he is. Where is Jesus? Spiritually speaking, he's going to all the unreached peoples of the earth. And some of them may not be separate people groups, but they might be your neighbors. That's where his heart and his mission is. If you haven't felt a real intimacy with Christ and a closeness with his Holy Spirit, it may be because you're off doing your own thing. And God is elsewhere doing his thing. If it appears he's not responding to all your invitations to come over and do what you're doing, maybe it's time for you to respond to his invitation and join up with him in what he's doing in the world. A couple of things happen when we join his mission. The first is the nations are happy because they've been waiting. People knowingly or not are waiting to be released from lives without hope and purpose. And the grace of God to, can do this. Secondly, not only are the nations going to be happy, we are happy because we are walking with Jesus and we're experiencing the one thing that most of us want to experience more than anything else. His closeness and presence in our lives. Maybe you've been reading all the right books and attending all the right services and coming to all the right seminars. Maybe you're learning all the right theology. But it's been a long time since you tasted a, a dynamic, living, intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. That in the words of David in Psalm 38, verse, 34, verse 8, enables you to taste and see that the Lord is good. 
Perhaps the road divided between you and God because he was going to the unchurched people, the unreached of the world, and was committed to the task of finishing the Great Commission. He walked on to share the good news, surrounded, if you can believe this, by the whole creation singing his praise. Well, we stayed where we are and sang another song, the one that we like more. Over time, our heart will become faint. We'll feel our faith is fading. But God is saying to us right now, there are people who are waiting for me. And if you're feeling weak and distracted by trivial things, it's because you've chosen your own thing and I'm committed to doing mine. So who's asking weak and imperfect beings to join him, to proclaim his message of grace and love and hope? The one asking is a God who doesn't need us, but who's inviting us anyway, out of kindness and generosity and love. He wants us to, to get involved in what he's doing in the world right now and to train others to keep getting involved in God's mission until the end of time. He's inviting us to walk with him as we share a role in his glorious plan. If we could hear the conversation in heaven, I'm sure we would hear God saying, who can we send? Who can, we, who can go for us? Because you remember what he told his disciples as they were in Samaria at the bottom of the hill that led to Sekar. The harvest is white. What should they pray for? Harvesters. Maybe you think your friends don't want to hear. Your neighbors don't want to hear. But if you decide in advance that they won't, you haven't given them a chance. It's not about being mean to them or rude or any other method that is contrary to the nature of Christ. But it's giving them the opportunity to hear the gospel that the power of God might work in them. Those who made a commitment to walk with Jesus in the New Testament responded to Jesus' death in specific ways. They heard the gospel. They understood the life of Christ in the New Testament. And they believed what they read and what they were told, specifically that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that he died to pay for their sins and was raised from death to a new life that they also might have life after death. They had repented or turned away from a life that's contrary to what God's word says. And they were willing to confess or, or acknowledge that they believed in Christ that he is Lord. And having done all those things, they were baptized in water, where they were united with Christ. And finding themselves in Christ, they received all spiritual blessings, including forgiveness of sins. If you have questions about each of these responses and what they mean and how they would apply to you, don't hesitate to ask me or one of our elders or anyone you know here who is a Christian if you're ready to be united with Christ, we're ready to help you understand and even to be about time. If you've obeyed the gospel but have some need that you would like to share with us, we encourage you to do it today. During the song that we're about to sing, please come forward. And let us know your questions or needs. Please don't hesitate. Come now while we stand and while we sing.